Brian and I are very excited. Brian and I are very excited to be here today to talk about AI as assistive technology. And um, we're going to, to jump in. This is going to be the first in a three-part series on AI as assistive technology. And um, we're hoping to, to get some feedback from you because the third webinar is going to be talking about your experiences with AI um, as part of the, hopefully as part of the presentation. So we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. I'm just going to share my screen and we're going to start our Google slides. Just, here we go. That arrange all these windows, right? Yep. Okay. Can you see that? Yep. Absolutely. And Naomi, is captioning turned on or should I turn it on in uh, Google Slides? It's turned on. So if people need captioning, they can just go to um, the, the link and turn it on themselves. Okay. Thank you for asking. Thanks very much. Okay, excellent. So as I mentioned, my name is Adam Crass, and uh, with me today is Brian Friedlander. We're both assistive technology consultants based in in northern New Jersey. And um, today's presentation is is hosted and funded by the Assistive Technology Advocacy Center of Disability Rights New Jersey, which, by the way, is New Jersey's Tech Act project. If you have questions about assistive technology and you're in, in New Jersey, contact ATAC and they will point you in the right direction. Um, today's presentation will be recorded and it will be uh, posted on ATAC's YouTube channel, uh, which by the way, also has tons of other assistive technology related um, archived webinars there for, uh, for your information. So there will be Brian and I's uh, webinars, but lots of other ones too. So check out their YouTube channel and um, browse their webinars. Here's the, the link to the shared Google Drive folder, which has a copy of our presentation. It's also in the chat. And um, as I mentioned before, today is the first of, of three. The, the other two uh, are going to be taking place in uh, on May 2nd will be the second one, taking a deep dive into AI apps. So it'll be uh, looking at the uh, apps that we're, we're presenting, introducing today. We'll be, we'll be doing a deep dive on, on a, a smaller number of them so you can really dig into their features. And on June 20th, we're going to be doing a, a, a webinar called Reflecting on Using AI. So we're going to be looking for input from you and, and others in the community that tell us about their experiences using AI as assistive technology, and uh, we'll be we'll be sharing uh, insights uh, of our own as well. Uh, a little bit about myself: I'm an assistive technology consultant. Uh, I work with children and adults with disabilities, providing evaluations, training, support, webinars workshops and modifications, customizations. I provide services in person in Northern and Central New Jersey and New York City and anywhere else via the wonders of phone or internet technology. Hi, and I'm, I'm Brian. I'm a assistive tech consultant. I have a background in um, school psychology and I do evaluations, training, implementation, and um, I'm, I'm available in New Jersey and uh, out of state via Zoom. And I, I offer free 30 minute AT consultations for anyone with a disability or a family member or anyone that works with them. Uh, those are all remote by phone, Zoom, Meet, et cetera. If you wanna set up a consultation, please send me an email at uh, this email address or give me a call and uh, we can schedule that. I just want to point out that uh, if you're in New Jersey or, or if you're anywhere in the U.S., you have access to an assistive technology lending center. Every state in the country 
has an assistive technology lending center, which is funded from the federal uh, tech act project. New Jersey's is a hosted at advancing opportunities. And a big part of assistive technology is being to, able to try it out because sometimes you don't know exactly if something's going to be a good fit until you actually try it. And uh, if you don't have access to it, the assistive technology lending center, if they have it, they'll send it to you. Uh, you can hang on to it for about a month and no cost. back. No cost. At no cost. They send it to you and they, they send you a return shipping label. So it doesn't cost you anything at all except your time. They also will help you out if you if you need help learning how to use it or or how to use it and um and, and give you suggestions on, on things you could try. So check out the the AT Lending Center. Uh, just a little bit of background on assistive technology for those who are new to the subject. It has two parts, the devices, which are the technologies or the apps or software, and it has services. Both components are important. They work together. And um, having the services without the devices doesn't really help that much. And having the devices without the services also is not very useful. Did I say that right? And um, <laughs> so it's important to have both. If you get new technology, um, the training is important. So everyone knows how to use it and also how to integrate it into, into what you're doing. Uh, let's say if you're in school, you, you need help uh, or coaching on how to integrate that into the learning activity. A nice um, framework or technique for matching assistive technology to individuals is the SET framework created by Joy Zabala. And uh, uh, Joy's approach was don't put the cart before the horse. Don't get seduced by cool technology. I mean, we're, we're talking about that today, AI. We, we, we don't want to get seduced by it. We want to make sure that we're using the right technology that matches the student, the environment where they are working or doing the, the task, and the specific task. And Joy's approach was um, adequately and fully define those first three elements before you start looking at technologies. That will help you make sure that you're not, you know, picking the technology because you like it. You're and instead pick the technology because it's a good match with your student, your environment, and your task. This is super important and it can be applied to any situation where you're matching technology to a person. <clears throat> Before we jump in uh to the content, uh uh, and the meat of the, the presentation today, we just want to get uh, a little bit information about who you are. Um, so if you could go to this link or scan this QR code and go to a very brief poll, uh, turn to page three and just answer a very brief question about who you are. Uh, we'll be coming back to this uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the presentation to answer some more questions about how we did today. So I just want to show that to you real quick. And here's the QR code. And just getting a little bit of information about you. Just remember everything's anonymous, um, but it does help us to get a snapshot of who's here today. So, so far, it looks like we've got uh, a lot of school folks um, and uh, some, some IT folks, community living folks, family members, and individuals with disabilities. But the vast majority of you uh, work in a school, you're either a teacher or a related school professional. <clears throat> so you can keep uh, entering this uh, after we turn back, but thanks for giving us that feedback. That's always really great for us. Okay. And to our shell. 
Okay. And as I mentioned before, we're looking for volunteers. If you've tried AI as assistive technology, including one of the technologies discussed today or something else, if so, we want to hear from you about your AI related experiences. And, th and this, we're trying to, to stick to assistive technology. And uh, if so, please email myself or Brian, and uh, we'd like to, to connect with you and, and just hear about your experiences. Uh, we'll be including <clears throat> your experiences and, and feedback we get in the third of the uh, the third webinar uh, that we do in June. So please give it a thought and uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. So um, Brian, would you like to uh, sure talk about this slide? Yeah, sure. So you know, I guess I've been in, Adam and I have been in the field for probably over 25 years now. And when we when we use the word I, AI for artificial in, intelligence, we'll talk about some of the to early tools that we work with that had that built in. They were really more kind of algorithms that were able to um, kind of forestall or um, predict certain events that would help help in and how the software was was developed. So, I mean, things like CoWriter used artificial intelligence um, in their algorithms to help um, predict what words students were using, whether they spelled it correctly or they spelled the word um, phonetically. What we're talking about now is really generative AI. And if you can think about generative AI is able to basically generate new content based on what content it was fed. So you can think of it this sort of a big, big database or a black box that is fed with information. And then based on what it's fed with, it then can generate um, information based on the contents of what's in that database. And that's important to think about as well. The databases are constantly being updated, but in, in many ways, it is a black box. We don't know what's in there. So that's the downside is we need to be careful because we may not know exactly where the contents are coming from. So, um, you know, the whole thing is a caveat emptor, you know, always be vigilant when you're looking at what is actually being generated to make sure it makes sense and where you can see where it's coming from. Using using generative AI like um, Copilot, which is Microsoft's version of AI, we'll talk about some other versions in a, in a little bit. Now, when you, it generates a response, um, you can, it will actually put a citation, that let you know where it generated the information from. So when you're looking about how AI can be used with AT, certainly um, in the area of, of grammar, um, spelling, the ability for AI, generative AI to summarize the contents of information or for that matter, to be able to create transcripts um, from audio. So there's lots of exciting ways that generative AI is going to be integrated um, into uh, AT. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the in the chat. We can go to the next one. So you know, with AI, we had you know artificial intelligence that kind of mimics the way. You know, humans make decisions. And that was kind of the early systems. They were sort of expert systems and they had some early on that would, you know, uh, you could you could basically uh, interact with that was like a, a, a therapist and it would return both, uh, you know, content that, to interact with the, um, you know, in, individual. And for the most part, the expert systems was what we were, we would generally thought was um, artificial um, intelligence. In a lot of ways, it was really um, algorithms, but it was the computer learning based on information that it was it was fed. And that's pretty much the older forms of what we consider artificial intelligence. So um, early on, you know, IBM had developed the AI that could play, you know, play chess, um, and actually, in some cases, even um, very competitively uh, interact 
and and play with uh, with champions um, quite easily. But now we have, like I said, generative AI that can generate information based on the the prompts that you put um, into it. So anything from virtual assistants, many of us have interacted with um, generative AI through the use of chatbots that you find on many websites or when you make purchases for products um, on the web and um, they're even being integrated into self-driving cars um, as, you know, as well. So it's, it is very exciting times, but of course we, some caution needs to be taken because like I said, um, we need to make sure that the contents of uh, what the contents are that it's basing the generative AI on. Yeah, and that's that's a good point, Brian. Uh, you probably have uh, all heard the term hallucination, and uh, some of the AI chat, um, some of the generative AI systems are providing information that's either made up or or incorrect, mm -hmm. and a lot of it has to do with a term I learned in college called GIGO, G I G O, and it was it's basically an acronym for garbage in, garbage out. So uh, AI models are basically, they, they hoover up all, all the information that's on the internet and use that as their, their frame of reference. And if some of that information is factual, that's great. If some of it is not or made up or, um, or, or, or is deliberately created to be false, then that's a problem for the AI system that's using that as their, as their knowledge. And that's that's one of the big issues that current generative AI systems are are grappling with right now. Um, now AI has been a part of assistive technology for a long time, and uh, a couple of examples of that are Dragon Naturally Speaking. This was one of the first commercially available voice recognition programs on the market. It's been around a mm -hmm. long time, mm -hmm. um, at least 30 years. Um, and it used an early form of artificial intelligence to recognize the sounds that we make and interpret those as actual words and turn it into text. Another early example of, of AI was optical character recognition, which now is, is pretty ubiquitous, but when it first came out, it was a big deal. <clears throat> you could put printed text on a scanner. The scanner would take a digital image, a digital photo essentially of that. And the optical character recognition program, which was a software program would interpret those dots and dashes and 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 the the image of a letter and figure out well is that an O or an A, and then convert it into computer editable text. Another early example of artificial intelligence. Uh, word prediction. One of the early the uh, best early examples is CoWriter, which is still around, uh, to try to predict the word that you're spelling while you're spelling it. That was another example of artificial intelligence using language models and it, uh, based on, on the way that people speaking English put words together into sentences, it would try to use that information to make its best guess as to what the word, the next word would be or the word you're working on based on what you typed. So here, this example, we saw W-A-L. All of these words would fit with this sentence grammatically. So, uh, But the program that figured that out was, was an early example of artificial intelligence. So, so one of the, I mean, one of the exciting parts of AI and AT is that with generative um, AI, 
it can compose text based on some what we may want to call a query or a prompt. So this can, you know, be for both selected documents or what you're currently working on. As an example, um, I recently had to write a letter of recommendation for one of my adjunct faculty members, and I decided I was going to give Grammarly AI a chance to do that. And my prompt was write a letter of recommendation for a um, adjunct faculty member who's a learning consultant and who teaches courses um, in, um, you know, in, in, in education. And it returned, I mean, a really beautiful letter of recommendation. I tweaked it a little bit afterwards, but the feedback I got from the faculty member was, was unbelievable. She couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it either. And it saved me probably at least 30 minutes of time. So one of the things that's going to be key as you begin to use AI is, is the prompts or the questions or the how you query the particular, I'll call it, you know, database or engine. That's going to be important um, as well. But not only can AI generate um, text, it can also generate images. So again, you might think about maybe students that are in an, an art class that are included in art and the other students are drawing, you may have a student who may have, you know, physical challenges that can create drawings based on the contents of using something like, like DALI to create an image. And uh, even going further than that, you now, there are some engines or AI that's being developed that you can create um, right now up to about a minute and a half videos based on prompts um, as well. And Adam spoke about hallucin, halluc you know, that these engines sometimes can hallucinate. So you got to be careful and just check what it's returning. Uh, because as, as we said, it can return false information. But it's, uh, it's really exciting when we think about the potential um, of using these technologies um, to support students uh, who have learning challenges. So how can generative AI be used as AT? Um, we're going to be going through a series of, of examples of, of AI that uh, that we think have great application um, to support uh, people with disabilities in, in a variety of situations. So the, the first um, generative AI resource will be ChatGPT. Um, and this is a free resource that you can um, you can utilize. Um, the free version is three version three point five, but ChatGPT four point is available as a premium um, subscription. So if you uh, and the the difference is that with ChatGPT four, you're going to get uh, more current, uh, let's say periodicals, articles, research when you do your prompts. So this is part of the Open AI project, um, and uh, this is the project that kind of launched um, the the whole generative AI, um, I would say, industry. And this is the engine that's used by a lot of uh, other developers that are utilizing the services. So a lot of them, um, you know, are using you know what call APIs, or uh, these are kind of plugins. Um, so this is this would be the back end to a lot of the third party AI products that um, are being are being used. So there was a question. Um, so with generative um, AI, you're, it's actually creating new content based on whatever question um, you have, whereas um, if you're just thinking about AI, I mean, we showed as an example, co-writer would be an example of just AI. It has algorithms that are um, that it it knows to pull from when students are writing um, to predict the words, but it's not generating. Like for example, with generative AI, I can create a whole report on let's say what are the benefits if I, I could put a query in. What are the benefits of using 
um, AI for students with learning disabilities. And it would generate an entire report uh, for me based on my um, based on my query. You know, actually, Adam, why don't um, I'm gonna, let's come out of this. I think I'm going to let me see. I'm going to share my screen for a second. And So this is um, open AI or known as chat GPT. You can log in. This is free for the version 3.5. Um, so here's chat GPT. So you see, I was talking about API. So these are basically modules that allow developers to plug chat GPT into their, their products. So. Just going to log in with my, okay. So here's, this is what the interface uh, looks like. So again, using generative um, AI. Now, if you look over here, you can see that if I went to chat GPT-4, it's an upgrade. Um, but I'm just going to use this. So I, now, so we, now I can say, um, write me a report on the benefits of using audio to capture lectures in a college classroom. And um, now I'm going to click on that, and so you can you can see that how quick this is, how it's generating um, the benefits of using audio, and it comes with a con conclusion. And um, now, if I wanted to, I could copy. You can see I can copy this, and I can paste this into Google Docs or. Um, or anywhere that I see fit Microsoft Word, but you can see how quick that was. And the other, the other nice thing too is it would all it will also read. It has text to speech built in um, as well. So you can think about uh, again. So these are the pluses and minuses. Uh, we want to teach students how to write, but we don't want ChatGPT to write everything for them. But for students that may have difficulty coming up with um, ideas. Um, when they're writing, this might be something that you may want to look at. Um, you know, uh, so uh, this is, a, I mean, this is generative, uh, you know, AI. Now, if I do it again, it'll probably, it, it'll probably generate something um, that's even different than this. So it kind of varies where it's pulling the information from. So that's chat um, GPT. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually, it's a do that. I'm going to. So th this this is Microsoft Edge, and in Edge there's a little icon up here, and this is called Copilot, and um, this is basically Microsoft's version of Chat GPT. As a matter of fact, Microsoft invested billions of dollars in open AI, which is basically the owners of chat GPT. And I could do the same thing here. So I can, I can say, um, let's say, what are the best ways that students with reading disabilities could use generative AI? I got a bit like that, and I click here, and so in this in this panel, it will return the um it will return the results here, so you can see that it's 
it's generating um, the contents um, for me. And I can also copy this. Um, this also has text to speech um, built in. So if you're on the, you know, if you're using Microsoft Edge, I can copy this and paste it into Word, Google Docs, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, so that is great. And again, if you have students that, you know, need text to speech support when they're using this, I um, may I just kind of show you, click on this. Certainly. Students with reading disabilities can benefit from generative AI in various ways. Here are some strategies to support their learning. Summarization and simplification. Ask students to summarize key texts using their own words. Then use generative AI to create a summary in language that is easy for them to understand. This helps improve their reading comprehension and critical thinking skills. Flashcards and targeted intervention. I'm gonna pause that so again, this is a nice tool because it has the text-to-speech supports. The other thing down here, if you're working with students, they can actually use um, basically speech recognition. So they can actually put the prompt or the query using their voice in here um, as well. So we have ChatGPT, we have Copilot, and then um, uh, so. Google renamed their um, their version of called ChatGPT as Gemini. It was called Bard to begin with, but now they renamed it as Gemini. And of course, they, they're going to re, they're going to return uh, slight. All of them are going to return slightly different results because they they have inputted different information into their. I'll call it black box. So if I enter here, um, what are some of the best okay, word prediction tools for students with dyslexia? And you can see that um, you, you, it also has uh, word prediction built in here. Again, you can also, students can use their voice. You can also upload um, images. I'm just gonna click on here. And many of you may be seeing when you're doing queries in Google now that it actually is using the generative AI at the beginning of the, of the search. So you can see that um, it turned, got it, read and write, okay. And you also have, it also has, text-to-speech uh, built in here. What's unique with this is you can see, you can share and export, um, you can copy, but with this, you, you can export this right to your Google, um, Google Docs or bring it into Gmail since this is integrated into the uh, Google ecosystem. So, I mean, these are, as you can see, these are really um, exciting, exciting potentials for how students might use some of these technologies, um, you know, as a, as an AT. Any any questions? Any questions about any of those three? Yeah. So the question. So non-generative AI would be something like Google Classroom um, or. Uh, I'm sorry, word prediction kinds of uh, tools, um, uh, applications that use optical character recognition, uh, that use AI to figure out the words that are basically graphics. Those would be um, AI that are non-generative. Any Computer questions? chess. What's that? Yeah. Computer chess programs. Yeah. Expert systems. Correct. Right. All right, so I'm going to uh, let me. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to pass it. Adam, you can run the, uh, the presentation. Oh, I'm back on. Oh, okay. So here's. Um, oh, question in, in a school setting: Is there a digital um, trail to indicate cheating? 
Um, that it's a very it's a great question, but um, it's a complex question. There are a number of um, like Turnitin has a tool that can help teachers maybe figure out what if it was if if it, let's say an essay was generated, um, and there are a number of um, of of those kinds of tools. But there's also a lot of they they generate a lot of false positives too, and and so it, it becomes very complicated for teachers to definitively say whether this was created by them or by generative AI. So I think teachers are actually beginning to change some of their practices with regard to writing where students are being asked to uh, do more writing in the classroom for this very reason. Because I mean, for all intents and purposes, um, if, if you're given um, a writing uh, task to compare and contrast, two authors or two books, you can generate that in 30 seconds using these, these tools. So teachers are beginning to come up with different strategies to think about um, how to basically, um, you know, include more writing in the classroom, having mm -hmm. students having to hand in more interim um, you know, parts of their projects so that they can see the progress because you know, the night before you can go on general, you know, any of these sites and, and generate um, an essay. Of yeah. Course. And Brian, yeah. I, I heard something very interesting on this subject yeah. that NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Yeah. Uh, now they forbid any use of AI in the student's work. Really? Because they found that it was too difficult Oh, it's and it's, too much work on the professor's parts to right. determine if someone actually wrote something or not. Yeah. Uh, so they just said, forget it, cross the board. Yeah, there's, there's been a number of cases too, and even in the public schools where you know um, students have been um, basically, um, I guess they're you know the, uh, they've been in a sense punished when a teacher thought that something was written by AI, even though the student said that they wrote it. And so there's, there's a lot of those kinds of cases. So like I said, teachers are gonna have to change their strategies um, or, you know, and maybe at some point, uh, some of the tools. Um, yeah, code word absolutely. In. Oh, okay. I've seen where some teachers will put a code word in the prompt and then make the text white, interesting. Um, so yeah, it's, it is definitely, um, an issue that has to be um, be looked at. Um, let's go. Okay. So I just wanted to, these are some examples. So this is a um, a software application called AOA. Um, it's, it's a company out of Wales and they've integrated AI into this mind mapping application. Many of you may be familiar with Inspiration. This is a web-based tool and uh, I'm just going to, play this video or actually Adam if you could run this video and, mm -hmm. and just make it make it bigger got the volume all the way up I don't hear any sound you don't hear any sound all right hold no. on a sec one minute it may be coming through your headphones um let me just uh, share sound. Yep. AI into Is that better? Yeah, got it. So I wanted to show you that. So I'm going to create a new map. You want me to start over? No, it's good here. It's good. That it can generate um, ideas. So right over here, I can put my prompt. So um, I can say... Generate a mind map about maybe the Beatles. And I'll, I'll click uh, generate. And now it's using the AI to generate that um, that map. And you can see that it um, 
has some really interesting um, information that I could add additional ideas to. So this could be a great um, tool for students that often have difficulty generating ideas because it will create a skeleton and then students could um, extend this, add additional um, information um, into the map. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this and click on the AI. And now I'm going to click on ideas. And look, you can see that we expanded out from that um, as well. So if students have difficulty generating ideas, this could be um, a good tool to uh, take a look at. If you have any questions about how you might integrate this tool um, into the student's workflow, um, please let me know. So in addition to be able, being able to create a mind map from an idea, Students can also use this and paste, let's say, a paragraph of text uh, into this application, and it will generate uh, a mind map based on uh, basically pulling out key points of the text. So I just I'm just wondering, you know, if you think this might be a useful way to use this application, or how you might use this application with students. You can actually turn on your microphone if you want to jump in and. So uh, I'll jump in. I'm sorry, I have laryngitis. Okay. But very often I am presented with students that have difficulty with writing, and part yes. of their difficulty is generating the ideas. Yes. 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 Um, you know, I know this is not. This is. You know, I don't know how to think about this, but right. it, it certainly would be helpful. <laughs> right. I mean, at least it, you know, it, it it would it would give the student an opportunity to then look at what comes back and then you could have a discussion and figure out what makes the most sense. In addition, with this application, just like inspiration, it can generate an outline that you can then um, export into Google Docs or Microsoft Word as well. So it could be a good starting point or at least get get the student involved in a discussion of what they're going to be writing about. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of nice. Uh, and it's web-based. Uh, it also works on iPads and iPhones and things like that. So it's kind of nice. We would also like see this being gateway. helpful. I'm sorry. It's like a gateway. Mm -hmm. it's, yes. it's like the a beginning point for independence, which Correct. Our, so many of our kids just don't have that. Right. Um, Ariane, what, at what level do you work with students? K through 12. K through 12. Okay, great. Great. All right. Brian, I could also see this being a really great way to show examples of how a mind map could look and, and what it means to make a mind map. So right. you could use an, another example that is not necessarily the topic that you're working on, Mm -hmm. to help students get examples of what they, you know, could look like right. as a model. And, and also um, in the past too, I mean, teachers have used this as, um, uh, as study guides to create study mm -hmm. guides. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't turn on the feature, but it has a feature too, to add additional notes and images as well that will pop up into the mind map. So again, if you need that, students need that support, you can add graphics to it um, as well. Great. Thanks for sharing. Hi, this is Dr. Friedlander. Yeah, and, uh, Whoops. Demo. Next, next. Yeah. Oh. So we went, We I spoke about um, Google Gemini. These are free services. You can play around with it. Um, it's great. Again, there, there are more specialized um, generative AI sites to go to for, you know, teachers if they want to write, you know, you know, uh, unit plans and things like that. But Gemini is free. Um, and it's easy to get to with a browser and you can kind of play around. And, you know, if you, for example, if you're doing, you know, if you're going to be teaching about photosynthesis or any other topic, you can put that in the prompt and it will generate a complete lesson with broken down every step of the way, including assessment. So um, these are great tools, but, you know, hopefully you can, between now and 
you know, the time, the third um, webinar, you'll have a chance to play with this and give us some feedback, but this is free. And this is the latest version from Google. It's their generative AI engine. And we, I took, we uh, showed you examples of, of Copilot um, and that's available um, if you're running Windows or if you want, uh, you can actually download um, Microsoft Edge. The Edge browser is basically a Chrome, it's a Chrome browser, it uses the Chrome um, engine, but now it includes Copilot um, in, uh, in Microsoft Edge. So if you want, you could always download that that's available on um, all platforms and you can take advantage of Copilot, which is actually running a version of ChatGPT4. So this will give you the most current, it will return the most current information. So um, when I say that, it, what it means is that, for example, Microsoft or ChatGPT is feeding it, you know, um, new research or new documents from, you know, 2024. ChatGPT only goes through, I think, something like 2022. So um, Copilot's great because it's giving you the most current um, application with the most current uh, data in their generative AI database. You're on, Adam. Okay, well, this is the next tool is called Humata AI. And one of the things I really like about Humata is that you control the inputs. Um, in other words, let's say, you know, the assignment is to read an article and summarize it or read an article and, and write a review of it or somehow synthesize the information. In Humata, there's a, you give it the documents to, to work on. And, and this way you get to control the inputs. Um, and it will also just focus on, on whatever documents you're providing to it. I think this is a really nice tool for students who need help with summarizing, which, you know, in, is a skill in and of itself. And, and it's hard for lots of, lots of students. Um, but also if you, if you need help, you know, kind of figuring out, well, how am I going to organize, you know, what I'm going to write about this, uh, this PDF article or some other article, Humata AI can help you out with that. I'm just going to show you a real quick video about this. How can Zapier transform your business? Well, let's say you're focused Sorry. on revenue growth, but you need marketing and sales to be have you ever found yourself buried in a pile of research papers, desperately searching for answers? Well, what if I told you there's a revolutionary tool that can unravel the mysteries hidden within your files? Get ready to unlock the power of knowledge with Humata, the ultimate AI-powered Q&A platform designed to simplify complex research publications, save you time, and accelerate scientific discovery. Imagine having the ability to ask anything about your files and receive instant, accurate answers. So here's how it works. Log into Humata. Once you're in, simply drag and drop your PDF file onto the platform. Within moments, your file is uploaded and the magic begins. You can now ask any question related to your document, wondering about the significance of a particular finding, or maybe you're seeking insights into a critical research topic. Simply type your question in the input box, and with a click of a button, let Humata's powerful AI algorithms analyze your document and provide you with the answers you seek. Whether it's now, one thing I, I especially like about this is, is you'll see uh, in that very first box, it says, according to the given document. So this is nice where you have uh, full control over what documents and, and what source information the tool is using to formulate the, the answers. Um, I, I know uh, uh, some college students that with their professors are are asking to use Humata as a, as part of of what they're doing in, in in their classes. So I think for a lot of teachers, Humata is a little a little bit uh, better than than some of the others in terms of the ability to 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 know exactly what the inputs are. This is this is an important factor, I think. Yeah. So. Um... Vanessa says she really likes Humata because it only uses what you provide it. 
The other thing too is um, for those of you that are using full versions um, of Adobe Acrobat, um, Adobe Acrobat Pro, uh, Adobe has integrated similar functionality so you can actually open up your Adobe Acrobat file, your PDF, and then you can query um, you can query it right within Adobe uh, Acrobat. The other thing too for college students that are looking for who have to write research papers, um, there's a um, well, there's a an application called Scholar C S C H O A O L A R C Y, and it allows students to basically upload research articles and uh, Scholar C uses AI to uh, summarize, pull out key points, and it allows students to quickly um, assess whether it's a, a, would be a good research document to include in their, um, you know, in their paper. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I'll put, I'll put it in the chat. So if you have any students that are at, in higher ed that are doing research, this can be um, uh, interesting um, service for them. Point, Brian. So this is a um, OrCam Read is probably one of the most innovative um, assistive technologies I've seen in probably the last 35 years. So OrCam Read, basically the size of a candy bar, um, can take a, a picture of a page of text or even a digital screen um, and can provide immediate OCR and read the text. Um, out loud. Um, it's very lightweight, very portable. Um, so about 25 years ago, I saw Ray Kurzweil, who developed, um, you know, the Kurzweil reading, reading application. He had a Nokia phone and he had a, a, a Canon digital camera. He literally had the phone and the camera duct taped together. And he took a picture with the Canon digital camera. And then at that time, no, the Nokia phone was one of the most advanced phones and could process the information. And so the phone processed it and then it would read it. So to move from that to something so elegant um, is pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, I could actually. Now, Brian, yes. quick question on the OrCam. It, it definitely has artificial intelligence, but uh, I believe it's adding some generative AI features as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is the, if you can see this, it's probably what, uh, maybe four inches. It doesn't require, I'm going to, let me unblur my, um, let's see if I can unblur my video. Okay. So you can see that that's as, that's as big as it is. So the, the, or, the original OrCam just can do the OCR and reading, but now OrCam read three, actually, what you can do is you can connect this um, to your computer. So anything that you take a picture of will come up on a web-based application. And then you can use things like OrCam, uh, you know, create a summary, or you can actually ask it additional information above and beyond the text that you um, actually scan. Um, it's a very powerful um, solution. Originally came out for individuals with visual impairments called MyEye. But this one is more geared, the OrCam um, and the OrCam Read 3 is geared for students with dyslexia, reading disability. So if you need really quick access for text, this is a pretty incredible device. Uh, uses uh, You can either plug a headset or you can also connect via Bluetooth for a discrete um, you know, um, learning and reading um, experience. It's quite powerful, quite incredible that no Wi-Fi is needed to um, do the OCR. But it's still very expensive. So basically, you you connect by Bluetooth to a cell phone. Um, right now for your it's internet okay. access. So basically, right now, OrCam Read Three is for a, a you know a computer. It uses a web. Bit. You right now they recommend create you know connecting the OrCam Three uh, via um, a, a USB cable to to a computer for that for those services. Oh, I thought I said Bluetooth. Okay. No, this one has Bluetooth for like headsets. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Now, Brian, I just want to let you know we we've got six minutes left. Oh, God. I think we have to stop, hard stop at one. So okay. You know, um, so just quickly, if you're if 
students, especially more probably at the college level, are using Otter AI for basically recording the audio and then providing um, providing transcripts. Okay, we can let's, we can go past that one. One thing I did want to say about Otter AI is I believe it can determine that there's more than one speaker. Correct. Talking and it will it will designate you know each one as you know individual one speaker one speaker two. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. And it's great again for you know even if you're doing postgraduate work and you're doing you know uh, interviews as part of your research project these are these can be great tools. So I just want to kind of just kind of show you what's happening. So th this is called Plaud Note and. What this is, this is a digital recorder. And what this does is uh, basically you come into a, a lecture, you press one button, it records the audio. It then connects to, uh, when you're done with the lecture, um, it connects to an Android or an iPhone. And then using ChatGPT, it transcribes the entire lecture. And then utilizing services of ChatGPT, it will create a complete transcript or a summary of the lecture, as well as a mind map of the lecture. It's all automated. Um, and um, it, the transcription is just, it's unbelievable how accurate uh, this is. And again, this has the advantage of uh, your phone doesn't have to be out um, in order to do it. The big issue and something that we all need to consider going forward is, you know, policies with regard to audio recorder, recording you know, in the public, in public schools, not so much of a problem at the college level, but um, for high school students who will eventually use audio, that is the trend with a lot of these services, um, is using audio to capture uh, information in the classroom. And so what we're going to do is, ne the ne for the next session, we're going to go into more depth into these tools and kind of, kind of show you um, how they work. Um, if you have the deck, um, Pigeon Messenger. This is a, a similar tool, except it uses your iPhone or Android phone to provide full transcript based on um, audio recordings. That just screenshot. Um, so this we might have to skip a few of these. Yeah, I just skip, yeah, that's similar to. Can we go to? Can we go skip to, ahead to the. Yeah, um, go to Diffit. That's I the one. Actually, I want to skip ahead to the um, Go ahead. to quick pick. Good, but uh, there's a lot we didn't cover. <laughs> well, we can, we can, we can. Uh, the next one, we'll go over some a little bit more in depth that we kind of passed over uh, quickly. Okay. As you, there's a lot of information. Go ahead. I just want to say a quick a quick word on quick pick because this is a little bit different. This is yep. a, an app for communication. It's an, an AAC app for, for people with communication disabilities. And the AI part comes in designing the pages. Wow. So this is, a, this is designed to be a time-saving device for speech therapists who often have to create, if they're creating a custom page on a topic, it's time-consuming. So what Quick Pick does is you take a one picture that it represents the topic, and then Quick Pick goes out onto the internet and finds, uh, creates a communication page that lists all the vocabulary and and parts of speech and and core words that you might need to talk about that topic. So that one looks like it's talking about um, a snowball fight of some sort or something of snowballs. Exactly. So yeah. you you pick the picture and then it populates the page. Um, the 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 designer of this, uh, the main designer, um, uh, Howard Shane, who's well known in the AAC world, decided mm -hmm. that Chat uh, Chat GPT is not really at the right level to actually help a person decide what to say. That should still be done by a human, but. Uh, is using it to to help create the pages. Could you go back just to diff it? Because I think that would be a good. Um, to, yeah. So um, if. Oh, oh, sorry. So this um, when we, you know, all of us in special ed have been talking about differentiation 
And DIFFIT for teachers is really incredible. It allows teachers to differentiate the contents of what they're teaching for all different levels in the classroom. And not only that, it also allows teachers to create activities. So for the next time, if you can try DIFFIT, I believe it's free for like 30 days. Um, and, and then we'll go, we'll go into more depth uh, talking about it. But what's nice too, this integrates with Google Classroom so that when you're done, you could take what you've done and send it to, to Classroom. But for example, if, you, if you're teaching, let's say um, on the topic of photosynthesis, you can create content that's at a third grade level or a fifth grade level or even a college level, and it will differentiate the content and build it from scratch um, for you. So we'll spend some more time with Diffit um, in our next um, next webinar. Okay. Um, if you would be so kind as to uh, go back to the Menti poll and just complete pages four, five, and six to tell us um, how we did today and, and what you got out of the uh, webinar would be greatly appreciated. And again, we're looking for, for volunteers. If you have the time and interest to try any of the apps uh, and programs that we talked about today, or, or even the ones that we didn't get to, or any other uh, AI applications that you've used with people with disabilities, uh, please send us an email, connect with us, and, and let us know what, uh, what you found and, and what you thought of it. Adam, can you go back to the QR code? Yeah, okay, thanks. So at this point, uh, we, we can open up to, to a few more questions, Naomi, if we have time. If not, we will um, uh, we will say thank you. And uh, it was great to see everybody. And um, we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much, Adam and Brian. Um, now is the time to ask questions if anyone has any Final thoughts or questions to ask. If not, I will say thank you everyone for coming. Great. And this was a fantastic presentation. Can't wait until the next one. So we will see you all soon. Thank you. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. Thank, thank you. you.